Hello, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I'm Nora Burnett Abrams, the Mark G. Falcone Director of MCA Denver, and I'm thrilled to be hosting this conversation between exhibiting artist Neri Ward and Sir David Ajay, the architect behind MCA Denver's exquisite building. It's an honor to welcome these two world-renowned creators and innov innovators today. Should you have any questions during their conversation, please share them in the chat. This conversation is part of our ongoing free virtual summer program series. Nary Ward, We the People will be on view at the museum until September 20th. And we have plenty of other programming happening through then. So if you would like to keep up to date with all of our events and programs, please text MCA to 56512. That's text MCA to 56512. And of course, if you enjoy today's program and want to continue to support us, please visit our website at mcadenver.org slash support to donate. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Nary Ward and Sir David Ajay. Since the early 1990s, Nary Ward has produced works by accumulating staggering amounts of humble materials and repurposing them in consistently surprising ways. His approach evokes a variety of folk traditions and creative acts of recycling from Jamaica, where he was born, as well as the material textures of Harlem, where he has lived and worked for over 25 years. He uses language, architecture, and a variety of sculptural forms to reflect on racism and power, migration and national identity, and the layers of historical memory that comprise our sense of community and belonging. His exhibition, We the People, occupies our entire building and remains on view through September 20th. Sir David Ajay is recognized as a leading architect of his generation. Ajay was born in Tanzania to Ghanaian parents and his influences range from contemporary art, music and science to African art forms and the civic life of cities. In 1994, he set up his first office where his ingenious use of materials and his sculptural ability established him as an architect with an artist's sensibility and vision. In 2007, Ajay completed MCA Denver's current home, Ajay Associates' first public commission in the US. On completion, MCA Denver received the distinction of gold leadership and energy design, making it the nation's first LEED certified contemporary art museum. Please join me in welcoming Neri Ward and Sir David Ajay. Great, great to be here, Nora. Great to be here, Nora. Thank you. Thank you both so much for um, being a part of what will undoubtedly be a very lively and richly layered conversation. Um, I was hoping to kind of kick things off um, by putting, um, uh, putting a, an address to you both. It seems to me that so much of your work, um, collectively, individually, um, David, your work is so much about bringing the world in, letting the world in. I think of um, Leo Steinberg's um, description of Robert Rauschenberg's combines, that what they did is they let the world back in again in a, a moment after abstraction. Um, and, and you know, the privilege of curating exhibitions in your building, David, has been that it can, the works so often, uh, and the artists whom we work with can so often engage with the city itself through the apertures and the windows that you've created in the, in the spaces of our building. And to me, it resonates so well with Neri's work, which also is so much about bringing in lived experiences, both from the past and the present, um, to call out and to call attention to um, so many episodes of the past and certainly of our present that, that uh, warrant further and greater scrutiny. Um, so I'm hoping that um, just by way of kicking things off, that we can maybe start by talking about the ways in which you both do really let the world in. Um, and maybe even the particular cities or communities that you're a part of, that you really bring that out. Thank you, Nora. That's um, I love the way you've uh, described the work um, through that um, that that sort of that lens, if I can use that term. Um, 
for me, that has been a way to um, make more democratic the, 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 the kind of privilege of making public buildings is to open them to the widest possible spectrum of understanding about the notion of public buildings, which is a it's a really amazing construction, but every generation learns about what this might might mean. And for me, to make public architecture that is accessible by as many people as possible relies on an, an ability to, to be able to work within the context and to be able to allow the building to open itself up to its context and absorb it into the into the heart of it and also project back to that context in a kind of very interesting dialectical way that it's it's kind of operating both in it and also through it and and I found that as a way to you know for maybe that was maybe a metaphor of myself being you know growing up in London and being you know of African descent and being a, you know in a, a minority in a sort of in, in, in an English culture but this idea of you know always understanding my environment um, and wanting to be relational and, and, and learn about it. And in a way, I think that that's sort of come into the work as a kind of foundation. Um, in almost all my work, I'm continually exploring how we, um, we look at ourselves and we look at our place. And I'm also very interested in that idea that I know that the place will change. Sometimes the frames that I make will evolve and there will be different views. But in a way, that for me is also part of the kind of magic of it, that it's always inviting this relationship. So I love it that you, you know, that the artists that you're talking, that you've worked with, enjoy that and work with it or not. And, and that for me is, is, is very, very special of, uh, you know, the privilege of making public buildings. I, th I think for me, uh, similar to David, this idea of place is really a, a sort of key moment, key anchor. Um, and, I was, and in terms of trying to find a way for the experience of the viewer to be engaged, mm -hmm. uh, using the quotidian object has always been the approach, that, that humble object. I, I don't want to say the garbage, because I always think that that's, um, that's not what I'm interested in. It's always these things that have a story, um, and they trigger me wanting to take them on a journey, or they take me on a journey. So it's really about getting those uh, things and then finding a way to give them, uh, I guess, in a way, give them dignity. Mm -hmm. And in creating that, that sort of space of dignity for them, um, a building that space, that built space, uh, I think that that's a key strategy for me uh, in terms of what I want to view, how I want the viewer to be in, engaged with this material. But also, it's a little bit of a lot of ego, because in a way, I also have to, I can control how they navigate these things. Right. And in, in that control, I always want the objects to be open-ended as possible. So the idea that they they are present, um, they they may be you know scattered and coming from the street. Um, that the project that I want to show, uh, Exodus, for instance, is a really good example of that. It's these objects collected from the street. Then uh, the 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 challenge for me is what is that built space? What is that new experience that they're going to? Uh, pull the viewer into. And so bringing energy, bringing the energy of the making, the bringing the energy of the mystery into uh, the work is kind of pivotal, especially in that, that piece. Um, and also literally energy, like you see within the material and the manip manipulation of the material, this uh, interest in giving a kind of physicality. Um, in this case, it was fire hose, uh, whether it's through the burning or the ringing of the fire hose, really bringing the viewer into this uh, ritual of mystery. And that ritual of mystery is really about conjuring their own experience with what is something that's wrong? What is something that's burned? What are these things? Um, how do they resonate in their lives? And then what is the expectation for the journey we're taking them on? So yes, this is um, the Exodus piece. And the titles in all my work, titles are really key. Exodus was definitely about you know this notion of taking them somewhere else. Uh, so these things are dormant, um, they're, you know, built and they're there, but then you look at the large Mandela form and that's the, that's almost like the vehicle for bringing them on that, uh, the viewer on this, on this uh, journey. So for me, that, that built space becomes the key for taking the viewer somewhere else. Can I jump in? <laughs> sure, sure, dude. 
I um I I love Exodus. Exodus for me is I mean I love all all the works for all for different reasons, but there's something about the way in which Exodus really um, also summarizes um, and sort of is a kind of DNA of this idea of the dignity of the other. Um, and and there's something very profoundly moving about it because yeah, I think um, you know garbage is the wrong word, but it's actually residue residue of the other um, and this idea of somehow bringing dignity to the things that are left by the human experience with matter is so profoundly uh, important um, and in the way we construct narratives we seem to always kind of you know think that certain things have much more importance than others and i think artists great artists like yourself are always reminding us not to forget that actually that the kind of the the most you know and I and you know for me that's the thing also in the front of your building you know we the people that the the dignity and the stories you make come from the very sort of the the, the you know the, it comes from the populace it comes from it comes from the the citizens it comes from the people you know and that is a really profound thing that we we must kind of always remind ourselves about um, the value of and the lessons learned. So I, I I just love it. I mean, it's it's such a strong statement, Exodus. It's you know it's biblical, of course. So it's it sort of has this very powerful narrative. But I don't know. Can, can you also yeah. the Spirit, the Parliament of Moses? Yeah. I you know, I grew up as a Baptist, so the Exodus, uh, the biblical is definitely part of my um, historiology. But I, mm -hmm. I don't. You know, the thing is, I I didn't want. And then there's a Trinity, right? There's a three in one. Yeah. But, but I, I didn't want it to get. Um, framed only in that. Uh, mm. So that was one. Then there's Bob Marley's song, Exodus Movement. Of, uh, yeah. So this yeah. idea of movement was really the key. Mm. Uh, and, and, to, and to bring movement to present, uh, to the present, I had to have stasis, right? So there is uh, there is this moment where everything seems like it's, it's in a holding pattern. And then there's the mandala that's conjuring this notion of movement, you know? So that was really uh, important. And the other thing that's, you know, it, in a lot of these built environments, um, David, the, what I really think about is how to bring back the street in a, in a way that 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 chance. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's some there are things that are framed to be shown. And then there there's always something that's hidden um, so that you, you're never quite experiencing the entire thing and that and the rest is being added to and amplified in the viewer's imagination. Right. And I think that that part of dignity is also about the thing having power, giving mm. it power and the power of not ever being really completely reduced to being present is really um, a part of it as well. You know, they, these works are all um, these objects were all conjured from the Harlem of the 90s. Right. And it's a different time in, in Harlem. Uh, and, and I would run up onto these empty lots and find entire, you know, photo albums. Um, entire sort of remnants of people's lives that were abandoned. And so I never really did see them as, as trash. I, they were always uh, somehow a, an element of loss, an element of, um, of maybe even regret. You know, there was so much emotional impact these objects had. So the, the challenge for me was how to, to treat them with dignity and find a space that they could be something else. They could be an experience, a new experience for the viewer. And, and this was done when I was in, in residence at the studio museum in, in Harlem in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as, as an artist in residence there, a, a really important time in my development as a, as a young artist. And just as a, a footnote, you know, I, I, I would be, I just wanna frame this out there is I was fortunate to have studied with the gentleman who started the, the residency program. Um, I went to Brooklyn College and studied with William T. Williams, this amazing artist. And um, I felt like that was just a really great connection to this space as well when I uh, when I went there. And you're um, you're working on the studio museum. No, the studio museum is is part of our shared our shared history um, in the sense that you know I mean I you know this is the image of what's coming in in hopefully um, two and a half years we this building will exist um, on 125th I think finally maybe anchoring as a counter to the commercial developments that are happening, a sort of significant cultural hub that really will celebrate um, the street life, the identity, 
of, of the city. Um, and I'll talk you through some things about it, but I just wanted to say what's kind of incredible about the Studio Museum for me, it was a space of resistance to begin with. It was a kind of protest against the exclusion of, of artists of color in the mainstream, in the narrative. Um, and so it was a kind of space of resistance that incubated artists and, and really, you know, helped them to find their first shows, find their first galleries, place them into, into the context. And, and that work still carries on. And some of the great artists that we know, including yourselves, you know, Kerry James Marsh, all these incredible artists, the Esther Gates, all have come through this program. You know, the artists that we just take for granted as being part of the milieu have really all benefited from this push. So it really goes to show how this idea of the support at the beginning is critical and it's still critical, even in this time, the support that kind of incubates artists. So the building is now grown up. I think that they, it's, you know, the, the, the beginning was the kind of guerrilla activity, as I call it. And now this is, this is the Studio Museum going into the 21st century as a center of excellence, um, a space where um, at the very base, what you're looking at is a lot of transparency where the incredible street life of Harlem, um, the, the, the trustees and, and, and specifically Thelma Golden, who I you know, collaborated with very much to make this building, you know, the vision was to see if we could capture the street, capture the, the spirituality, capture the theatricality of Harlem, the sort of three um, sort of, sort of, in a way, let motifs that were given to me in the brief. The ground plane is really this idea of dissolving the street into the museum. So this is a museum where there isn't a barrier. You don't cross a gate or a moat. You don't cross a giant plaza. You dissolve straight into it. And the and part of the facade completely opens up and allows a sort of reverse stoop to happen, which you'll see in the section in a second. Up above it, you have children's spaces that are low. So the slot window is a kind of a suite of education spaces. And then the one above is a suite of north facing studios. Um, and then the large glazed window is the meeting space of education and the artist. It's this large room which spills out onto 125th, looks out onto the whole thing. And then up above it are gallery spaces, offices, terraces, and uh, spaces for exhibition display up in the uppermost corner, um, allowing for permanent works to be commissioned to be part of the building or temporary works to kind of happen. Um, along the kind of curatorial sort of program that um, the, the leadership there is imagining. So let's look at the section. So the section really, you see how, you know, what we've been able to do because it's a cultural building is that we're able to make a building that projects more than a normal um, office building. You know, that's a sort of zoning issues that you would never be able to allow to do, but we, we're allowed to project over the street to model the facade much more three-dimensionally than a normal commercial building can be. And then that's what takes advantage of the ability to kind of allow art to not just be inside the building, but to be completely on the building as well. So that, you know, the, the experience of art is being given to people who are just going shopping, just going to you the know, subway, as well as, you know, the people who want to come in and, 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 and use the building. And you can see this references to Harlem, the idea of the stoop, which is on the interior. So, there isn't a formal auditorium, there's a stoop, which kind of is the reception space, which gathers everyone. There's this kind of soaring space with this giant staircase that we've sort of put into the heart of it as a kind of mechanism to you know, create a sort of, you know, to use that, um, to really learn from, for me, it's really a kind of folding of the dynamism of 125th, that we would fold it as a ribbon up the building. So it's a sort of, that's the, that's the, that's the pavement, the, the, the staircase is, Ten foot wide, so it's really like a street where you meet people, where there are places to rest, and you rise up. And of course, there's an elevator that takes you to absolutely every floor, which is right next to it. But the idea is that you know the the, the stair can become a kind of extension of the stoop, extension of the pavement that allows kind of moments and encounters to meet your friends, to say hello, you know, to talk about something off the side, and then to go into the exhibition spaces, and then to be able to kind of end on the rooftop and to be able to see both the south and northern aspects of the city. You know, the New York tilt and 125th is at that wonderful vantage point where, you know, you you know downtown is really low and, and 125th is quite high. So you get this fantastic panoramic stage overlooking the skyline. So we're hoping that that gives, you know, young kids and people don't kind of get to go up into buildings and do this sort of thing, an opportunity to come up and, you know, see their city and really kind of be feel that they're part of it. You know, something that I, studied in the Denver building, this idea of giving privilege to the most beautiful part of the building, which is the rooftop, which allows you to see, 
you know, your city and where you are, which is a few that most residents don't get unless if they're in some special place. You know, they're always on the pavement. So they're always looking, to, you know, up at buildings. And I think that this idea of allowing the public to be able to look down to, you know, that privileged sort of space is really important in the way in which you democratize public buildings. So the Studio Museum has this kind of quality in it where it does it on its small south axis. So anyway. I think that's great, David. I think one of the things that I respond to, uh, the two things that I respond to the most is I remember the energy of 125th Street, that that um, that sense of community that I and, and, and literally energy that you you as an uh, I as an artist and I think a lot of artists mm. really feed from and mm. you could it was palpable. You know, I remember at one point a little bit of history when uh, and it's it's just the flux. It's everything it's from the vendors to the stores to the 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 studio. You know, from the Apollo Theater, but I remember once. I think um, Giuliani, the then mayor at the time, you see, I'm going back to some history now. He had, he, <laughs> we remember it too well, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he he was gonna clean up 125th Street, I don't know what that meant. And and he brought, he took the vendors off. Um, and it was such a different feel, you know, it really um, felt like that energy was diminished. Um, oh. And and so it, they, it, it, that's such an important part, that, that kind of flux that you get. So the idea that you have that uh, street level energy opened up, I think is, is brilliant. And the other thing I, I really respond to, it's almost like the building looks as if art is supposed to hang on it. Like the, using the building right. as, as a, an apparatus for display in a way sounds amazing. You know, like the, the, the sort of recesses for things to go into. I think that's really beautiful. Thank you. So I, I'm glad you approve of the new um, the new proposal because we are taking down the old building, um, and so it will be gone and it will be replaced by this new building. I think it's down. I went by there a couple of days, uh, yesterday. <laughs> it's just a hole in the ground. <laughs> so you're you're, you're definitely on your way. You know, it's definitely definitely going there. Very very exciting. So the, the next project I think is the the one that we had um, talking about Harlem. You know, I I was venturing into this other project that. Um, is is the, the the project with uh, me collecting smiles the, the sugar hill um project where i actually went around and collect smiles on the street uh, of harlem and you did a building that was um actually the project i did was with a, an organization called broadway um my the project i was with was the organization called no longer empty and the commissioning organization was um broadway housing communities they're the ones that you did the building with but I got a chance to um, sort of be on, as part of the unveiling of this amazing building. So I'm curious about the building because I love, we'll talk about it, but I love what you did with the surface of it. Thank and you. That experiential dialogue of it. Um, so if you want to talk a little bit about it, and I'll, I'll follow up on what my experience has been with the building. Yeah, no, I'd love to hear. Um, Sugar Hill is important for me because it's my first housing project in the US. And it's um, it's a housing project for um, low-income communities and um, homeless people. So it was very specifically targeted towards the homeless and very low-income families. And you know, what was it was made possible by the donation of an incredible patron who was able to buy this piece of land, um, which is very expensive for these kinds of housing trusts to be able to afford. So they're able to stay and be in Harlem because of the kind of um, the generosity of this incredible patron. And and so then they were able to build the building with tax credits from the city and donations and all the things that they kind of very cleverly put together. And, you know, this is the space, you know, talking about the studio museum and talking about the space, this is the space of the Harlem Renaissance, right? From 120th to 155th, these are the kind of spaces of the Harlem Renaissance, which kind of birthed Duke Ellington, Langston Hughes, my angel. I mean, it's like the narrative of, African American sort of the sort of the great renaissance in the 20th century post war uh, pre war and post war is dead you know uh, this space this building was the uh, had on in a car park that Duke Ellington used to put his car in all the time and you know we have a fragment of that area in the building because um we just wanted to kind of have that providence of a place that Duke kind of you know walks all the time um <laughs> Um, but that also what's kind of amazing to me is that I wanted to remember this place because in that, even just as, you know, 150 years ago, that area was called Sweet Harlem, 
because you were coming away from the kind of stench and the sort of mustiness of the city, which was downtown. And you were coming to come to the garden areas and the flowers, you know, famous for these roses and flowers that were in these gardens because there were sort of Dutch settler farmers that were originally around here. So it was really a kind of retreat space. It was the countryside. And even during um, sort of the Harlem high time, this part of Harlem was seen as sweet Harlem still because it would seem to be higher, better air, et cetera. So I became really fascinated by that. And, and I love that you referenced the song, but uh, you know, you referenced Bob Marley and Exodus because I basically, in sort of going around recording all the kind of amazing, um, you know, uh, turn of the century buildings which use um, vegetable ornament, um, I wanted to kind of see if I could reinterpret that sort of, oh, that classical idea of ornaments um, of nature in, in a contemporary way. And I was sort of really racking my head about how to do this in a way that made sense. And in the end, um, I was listening to an, I'm a huge fan of Aretha Franklin and, and I was listening to Aretha Franklin and, and she, you know, that song Stone Rose in Harlem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it sounds really you kind of almost like it's Roost, but literally I, I remember that moment of the epiphany that actually Stone Rose and Harlem I was like, oh, I want to make this concrete building. Um, let's look at how we can create embossed roses into the concrete. And that would give us a kind of direct link to um, this idea of a kind of this ornamental architecture. So this is a 21st century version of ornament where you use a computer to indent uh, concrete in different thicknesses and your eye puts it together. So it's almost like a, you know, a pointillist painting. You know, it comes together as you move further back and it dissolves as you come in. Um, so it's a kind of indentation technique and it's really a series of roses at different scales. Um, actually specifically a column rose that grows in that area. And so the building has this kind of play with, with this thing. And then the whole building, again, does something I would do, which is this idea of framing, you know, the view and the vista. But I also, in this building, also kind of, you know, you can't, sorry, I don't have the image, but the, the sawtooth um, on the sort of facade directly references a building around the corner. It's probably one of the few times where I literally looked at a building around the corner, which was a kind of sort of famous building where a lot of immigrant families lived. And I just directly took the pattern and put it on this building. And, and it's really funny how I always have to tell people, well, isn't it, that's the building right there and people still don't notice it. And it's, it's, it sort of taught me a lot about what you think, you know, is obvious and that people go, oh no, no, that's not good enough. And how you can actually reimagine places through the way in which, you know, our artists and architects like ourselves can really allow people to see certain qualities in a place that they maybe don't even realize. So it's a very special project for me, super low cost, but it's really, for me, it taught me a lot about really looking deeper in Harlem. And you know, what's beautiful about it, it's not, um, the, the project has um, farming, uh, rooftop farming for the residents, and then it has community gardens all over it. Um, they've managed to kind of get this wonderful, um, you know, um, farm, farmer, out of town farm, uh, mar farmer's market that comes every Thursday or Friday to the building because we made a small plaza which is fantastic for the neighborhood but also that there's a crash um for kids for 125 kids there's a storytelling museum which is probably where you work um and there are community spaces um for the residents and for people to be able to use so it really has this very heavy public program on the ground and then this private courtyard space for the residences and the sort of rooftop for the residences the private space for the residents um, up above it. So we worked really hard with Sugar Hill, really, and worked with the city. Amanda Burden was the kind of commissioning, you know, was the city planner. And we worked really well with her and the Bloomberg administration at that time to really get, you know, the opportunity to have lift over runs to allow people to get to the roofs, which is on code that you, know, you can't do normally. And all these incredible benefits of the building because of the nature of the topology, the fact that it was doing something different, um, we were able to kind of break a lot of ground. So it's something I'm incredibly proud of. Yeah, they're, they're doing amazing programming. I, I always see uh, things that they're doing there. I, I have a really special connection to this site because I lived maybe 100 feet away, you know, or, or right down the street. Was, when I first came to, to Harlem, I lived, my uncle was a super of this building called 409 Edgecombe, which is a historic, yeah. with all, all these, uh, these uh, really important people who were there and um so i had to really you know for me doing a project in this neighborhood i was it was hard to get distance you know when i was invited my biggest challenge was how do i get distance to really 
think about another way to, to build a dialogue with the site and Sugar Hill. So I literally Googled Sugar Hill um, Harlem. And <laughs> at that time there was just kind of two, a competing narrative of uh, the story of two breweries, beer companies that were fighting for the name Sugar Hill. Um, <laughs> And so it really got to me like, oh, you know, and none of them lived, none of them had their business in Sugar Hill. None, none of them were in Harlem. But the, the brand became, uh, the Harlem brand became a kind of sought off a commodity. And so mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I had just come back from, from Rome in doing this uh, project, these canned smiles. Yeah. And I decided I wanted to, and then the idea that I proposed to the no longer em empty folks uh, was to raise funds for the museum, for the Sugar Hill Museum by selling these smiles that I was gonna can. And so we were able to put that in place. And it was one of these projects that I think I, I got younger every day because I was just outside, you know, making people laugh. So there's my get up, you know, and I had my little Jamaican cart with my um, canning machine. And I'd hack, there's a mirror in the can, I'd actually put a smile in it and, and I can it right straight away. Put yeah. it back in the, the cart and then we, we'd sell it at the, the museum for the um, the programming that the, the Sugar Hill Storytelling Museum is, uh, Museum of Storytelling is going to be doing, so oh, it's kind of full circle. The neighborhood uh, facilitating this project and the project facilitating something that serves the neighborhood. You know, so I, I really like how um, the conversation evolved. You know, with regard to you and your dialogue with the building. One thing, you know, it took me. It's, it's a tough building, David. It took oh, me. Yeah. A while, it, it took me a while to to get it. You know, like. It wasn't until I went inside and, and mm -hmm. saw the spaces that were really beautiful, the way you, you handled it, and uh, the regular windows. I wasn't used to this idea of the regular windows, but mm -hmm. the, the vistas that you captured were really, uh, that, that was such a key thing, you know, of, of um, the spaces that one looks out of. And it wasn't until I went up to the building and saw the, the moray patterns. I didn't know they were roses at first. I thought they were, they, for me, the building started to breathe. As you moved mm -hmm. along looking at the surface, it was undulation, you know, like, right. so these things are just shifting. So it was really, as a, as a physical object, I was really intrigued with the power of it, you know? Um, so I, I really uh, love that building I go by. And you're right now, you know, I think they're, it, it, it's such a, an important part of the neighborhood. You know, people really looked and regarded in, again, this where dignity comes up when you, when you look at it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I think, I don't know, we had an image of that interior space, maybe it might be worth sort of showing it, but I actually realized that I have one of your smiles on my sort of desk in, in my New York office. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't open it, don't open it, you gotta have faith. See, that's <laughs> that. that's it's, it's, it's funny, a couple of uh, years ago, um, a, a friend ran in, I ran to a friend and she, she told me that, oh, you know what happened? My daughter woke up one early morning and decided to open up the can and, 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 you know, and I said, oh, you know, don't worry, I'll give you a new one. And, and she says, yeah, but there's nothing. In, there was just a mirror inside. And I said, yeah, you have to, there's faith. There's a smile there, you know, but you got to believe in it, you know. And so that, that whole project, you know, we were talking about, you know, Manz Manzoni yes. and Manzoni's shit cans. And yes. I always thought of um, the minstrel, the African-American minstrel, and, that, and the smile not always being sincere, but the smile being of resistance. And so that that idea of canning a smile became, and the canned smile, the sort of, sort of that even the, the language of it, sort of became about um, something fictional. But the possibility that it could be aspirational and about faith was also really um, a deterrent from men's It wasn't a dead end about commentary and commodity, but also yeah. on you know a kind of uh, belief system you know that, yeah. that I wanted my mind to go into. Yeah fundamental to the way we construct ourselves. Yeah. Story, yeah, you, yeah. you know, yeah. so Harlem, you know, that Harlem adventure even there was really, um, really key. And and I guess this is the, the, the other thing about, you know, it, it being a children's museum was really the key thing. And then even now I said, all this programming gets done. Um, getting back to the idea of children, I remember one of this early pieces I did called Amazing Grace, um, where I was really thinking about, you know, objects and how they relate to, not, you know, humans, uh, us as, as uh, not as full grown, but also as children trying to being pushed into the world. So yeah, here's a, a sort of video of it. And, and I remember this moment, 
David Weir, I was walking down 125th Street. It's actually, I was going to the studio museum because um, I had a studio on 125th Street and Lexington Avenue. And I was wow. going to punch in. Back then, you had to punch in. You had to like, they want to make sure you were working. So you had to like, you're like a regular worker, you had to punch in. So you had to punch in. And I saw this abandoned baby stroller, right? You know, Park Avenue, right by the Metro North. And it's just kind of pushed up against the sidewalk. And it's there, and everybody was in flux. They were all going to, you know, the commuters of moving around. And just the singularity and the emptiness of it and the, and the isolation of this moment of this thing just being by itself uh, just stopped me. And I said, there's something here, there's a story about this thing, you know, this kind of uh, discarded or left, you know, um, object. And I, I decided to, to tell the story I needed more. And so, you know, I, I, it put me on this adventure uh, of collecting 365. Um, wow. So each day I'd go out, you know, I'd punch in and then I'd go out and collect um, these strollers. So this, um, yeah, and I just decided that number because it's like this idea of a, a full, you know, a calendar year. So um, that was an experience. That was an interesting journey of uh, understanding. It is, a, it is a lot. It was also about not just the museum system, but understanding the community and how, you know, when I was seen as a kind of marginalized individual, because you're pushing around these things, people don't understand. Yeah. That puts you in a different mind space of how you negotiate the community. And, and it, was, it was a real kind of a university of um, interesting experience for me, you know, in so many different ways. I mean, from, you know, from people looking at me with disdain to people get, offering me food, you know. And, 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 and it was a weird, it put me in a weird predicament because I, I you know, I'm a, like you said, it's really well. We, we become in the space of privilege as creators. So yeah. I, it was like, well, how do I negotiate? Do I tell them I'm an artist and this is what I'm doing? Or is that too complicated? So I would try to let them know, no, I'm an artist and I'm doing a project. And they would still look at me with this, the same with the, the, the smile part. They're, they still look at you like, what is this? Uh, you know? yeah. But that's a good thing because you're, 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 you're sort of letting them understand yeah. um, that's a, new, a new possibility, you know, in their, yeah. in their experiences, you know? But I, they, I, I, Sorry, I just wanted to add that there is a soundtrack to this piece, which is really about giving to that, that, adding to that moment of inspiration, aspiration, which is this uh, Mahalia Jackson rendition of uh, Amazing Grace, which is a very powerful um, iteration of it. it. You know, for me, just a quick thing on this, because I think um, uh, it's just, there's something about the way in which you make this composition, which suddenly becomes this arena or this, what I would call, the English would call a parliament, um, or Congress, the, the, the tension of this, you know, facing off with this collection in the center creates this sense of a kind of architecture within the architecture. I love seeing it in this installation shop. Um, that's just so powerful. I, I you know, I, I can't wait to see this installation here in, in the building with that light behind it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, the, the, um, yeah. The idea of trying to make initially Initially, I, I really was looking for a church. I wanted to, yeah. to, to show okay. this in the church. I, so I felt like that that space would be a space, uh, a redemptive space. But yeah. I, in Harlem, it was almost impossible to find an empty church, you know. Um, <laughs> so somebody told me about a firehouse. And, uh -huh. and I was already using, from the Exodus piece, I was already using fire hose. And um, so the, that made sense. And so I, I was able to use, um, to get that space. Actually, it's a little bit more complicated and, and funny in that the Studio Museum, when I was collecting these, I think at some point they realized that, you know, either I was having a nervous breakdown or I, I had other intentions with the piece that they had to address. So <laughs> they, they, um, they asked me what I was going to do because there's no way they had the space at the time, you know, to exhibit anything of this magnitude when they saw me collecting this stuff. So it, it was good that they did that because it forced me to to have to look at other options and really come to the reality that, yeah, this this, this really needs a larger space. So I yeah. ended up going and getting, you know, finding um, this uh, firehouse. And so the space, the shape kind of evolved out of me installing this. And, you know, and, and people have remarked that it looks like a boat, but I was really thinking about it as this idea of a womb, right? A sort of vaginal shape, a, a, a space of creation. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the, the birthing of a child, right? And so yeah. all of that was that was initially what where I was coming from with it. Um, but the boat part brought in the narrative of, of um, the middle Rain. passage, 
yeah. and uh, so I, I didn't mind it. And that's that for me also was in, in a lot of um, the work, you know, it's, it's how to add layers, not necessarily negating one or the other, but maybe a multitude of interpretations as a possibility. So I, I um, so that's how the work kind of the shape kind of evolved, and I like the idea the idea that the viewer walks between this narrative of uh, of this the middle section of being sort of knotted and tied and and almost the intensely held down, and then the, the section on the the outside being a space almost of of just witness, right? They're mm -hmm. just these other strollers are just kind of looking at what's going on, and you as a viewer have to. Uh, walk through that theater of, uh, that's happening, you know, as you're as you're um, proceeding along the corridor. This this work is really for me a profound monument. It's almost a sort of monument memorial, which I just you know it it starts to kind of move into this other kind of space, which I think you know for me is relational to you know important works. You know the way in which I started to kind of work, especially on the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, right. You know, idea of when an object becomes more than just what it is and also becomes something that starts to become almost like a memorial. Um, I think it has that kind of quality of memorializing and sacred, making sacred something, you know, uh, profound uh, and using that. that uh, yeah, it's, a, it's amazing that how that evolved and uh, it didn't start out that way, but it, it ended up that in that way. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, yeah. I mean, I like to talk about the, the I haven't gotten to this um, to the museum yet, but I'm look, I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm holding you to that to that invitation, by the way. <laughs> they, I'm, I'm, we can do it publicly, but they will. I'm sure we can arrange for a special tour for you. <laughs> um, you know, it's really interesting because for me, this this building, you know, there are lots of lessons. You see the lenses, the vistas that are you know talked about right from Denver that are all happening in the Smithsonian. Um, you see this idea of articulating the facade, but I think what happens with the Smithsonian is where suddenly the building and the site is so charged with this uh, weight that um, I, it's the first time where I sort of openly sort of, um, I sort of almost declare the kind of reference in a way that I've never been able to up to that point. It's always been overt and subtle and I've oscillated between using abstraction as a way to, you know, allow multiple interpretations. But in this building, I felt that that was not, would not be enough, that it needed a much stronger figure. And so this idea of really going to the narrative and this idea of not being scared of it because realizing that actually sometimes you, when you think something is literal, it's not even literal to the public, was kind of very reassuring for me in the earlier works that were done. So I really looked very much at, you know, the sort of, the sort of idea of West African kingdoms, the idea of the South and, you know, the sort of uh, sort of uh, ironwork architecture, the idea of labor, the idea of a building as literally redemptive from some from the depth to the height. So one that's not going horizontally or one that's going vertically. Um, water as an important, you know, the middle passage, water as the baptism of water, the sort of idea of the church as a space of resistance that was always used in the African-American community and still is. Um, you know, the building literally is a kind of, it, it uses the let motifs as a way to drive the narrative of the curatorial agenda. So it sort of punctuates and, and helps that from the outside and from the inside. Um, and it's really the first time that I, I sort of, as I said, you know, openly sort of declared. And, and, and it was because of this sense of the weight of this project and wanting to not in any way be light um, with such an extraordinary story of, for me, you know, um, a lot of people thought, think that the story is, it, it's, it's, you know, it's not, been a, it's not been a, not been a great journey, but 200 years in a strange land and to get to um, the place where from, you know, literally being considered chattel where we are is an extraordinary um, uh, sort of trajectory, even if it's, absolutely not perfect and it's still destructive and horrific but it's an extraordinary trajectory to move from being cattle to being you know citizens and to be contributing to this country and the evolution of this country and also the world by default because of this extraordinary sacrifice of this community in terms of what becomes human rights universal rights all of them come from the civil rights idea you know which is really understood from the you know from the sort of people 
um, who are also dealing with nation building and the idea of identity uh, and the importance of identity within uh, the sort of diaspora, the human diaspora. So um, there's something um, that, you know, for me was incredibly important to just celebrate about blackness <laughs> um, and, to, and to be, to, to really openly declare the importance of that community on the site where, you know, Washington was, you know, for me, ground zero, where so many black families lived in the back, in the background, almost in an apartheid state, you know, supporting the system, but never being visible. And so the, the building also had to declare, you know, Lonnie Bunch, the director, was so, said it so aptly, you know, he wanted a building which would, you know, declare itself in, in the light, you know, that it would declare itself a sort of brooding building that would declare its its own dignity. So for me, this idea of making a bronze building, you know, a Kemetin, you know, like brown building that with golden um, and sort of reflecting the light on the sort of symbolic space of the mall, which is all about light, um, seemed like a, a way to do it. And, and it's really amazing for me how the building is both a museum, but it's also become, you know, people just to say, I just went, I was in DC and I just went around the building. And I, and I always love hearing that when people send me little clips or little, images of like, I just run around the building and that was, I, you know, I got, I got something from that. And for me, that is so beautiful because the idea that somehow there's a kind of visible dignity that is being represented that, you know, you know, everything from African leaders to students go past this building and, and like they're touched and moved and they believe that there's a kind of, you know, something is happening. And, and, and so this idea of a memorial of sort of monuments and a museum so sort of this, you know, this three M's that operate in this project sort of evolved through the kind of research and the dialogue of it, and um, and sort of really for me transformed me too. So it not only was, was the work about making the building, but the work also transformed me um, in the way I work uh, now and, and the way I'm sort of doing projects now too. Yeah, I, I think another M I'd add is probably movement because I think that um, that idea, even even looking at the images, how you can kind of see through the, 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 the facade, you know, the, the, the screen. And I'm curious about at what point did you come up on this, um, this sculptor or the uh, metal worker? Uh, was, was that a, always, was that yeah. always uh, the, no. so it was a, planning it, did that evolve? Because this yes. are from or, or influenced by their work, right? Yeah, so it, it was always a bronze building, and I was always interested in some articulation of it, but it went through many iterations of panels, systems, and every time it just didn't feel right, it just felt too mechanical. And so, um, you know, in, in wonderful discussions with Lonnie, we kept talking and talking about, you know, how do we, you know, find a way to really be much more precise? You know, I think this project was all about how do we, how do we you know, how we can we be more precise with what we're saying always, rather than abstract. And so, you know, I, in one moment, I, I remember him talking to me and, and he pulled out something and he talked about, you know, this idea of labor, the labor of the South and, you know, you know the, the buildings of Louisiana and Charleston. And I just, a light bulb went off and I went, oh my God, we, we labor and, and the South, then for me, and the idea of labor now in making this building, suddenly fused the, 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 the two things together. And, I, and, and that's when the, the leap of faith happened in me as a designer, because I just said, I just literally want to represent this extraordinary work of people like Philip Simmons and all the kind of, you know, incredible laborers who were incredibly skilled in the DNA of the building. So I found the sort of ends. So really the, the ornament is not just a kind of freehand drawing of some sort of acanthus leaf or anything like that, it's actually, um, the mapping out of uh, a Philip Simmons cast iron panel and really almost doing, you know, like as an artist, when you learn how to do portraits and you use a pencil and you mark the face and you sort of measure the eyes, you know, and let's the life. It's literally a measurement of an ornament panel that's just been left as a point, point diagram and then just joined together as a matrix and then distorted to deal with the density that it needs to filter light on each facade. So it's a, it's a DNA point of the labor of those people. And it sort of then allowed me to let go um, and to just be the facilitator of making that thing happen for the building. You know, I didn't have to invent an ornament. It, the ornament was already there. I just had to show it to them. I mean, I see the strong connection between the Sugar Hill surface, the roses and, and this. 
this indexing of, of, of a pattern or a thing and bringing it or history and bringing it into the the I guess the live thing, the object, the built object. Um, I feel like that was kind of what I was thinking about with regard to the the breathing panels. It, mm. it was a project that yeah. I had um, right where I was um, visiting uh, Savannah, Savannah, Georgia, and there was the first African Baptist church, and on the ground floor, it, it was a site of the Underground Railroad, and on the ground floor they had these holes that um, enslaved people would hide underneath to go north, and they would make these cosmogram, these uh, Congolese cosmogram in holes, um, I mean, holes oh. on the floor pattern. And mm -hmm. for me, that was such a powerful um, moment of looking at this uh, historical um, sort of, I guess, event, you know, and I went. And I was thinking, you know, how can this live in another place? How can I, and, and I, the idea was to bring my body into the conversation. So the idea of marking the surface, which is copper in this case, with the, the body was really important. And then the labor of the light, these, these marks and the labor of the nails came away to sort of add a, a, a kind of intensity, but also um, a ritual to the yeah. But one of the things that would be, you know, one other thing I wanted to bring up that I'm curious about, because it's something that I've been thinking about in regard to my work, which is, you know, just to pull back a little bit, is the idea of music. Because, mm. you know, uh, um, I almost can break down my work into rhythms, and yep. whether it's about melodies and, and contra contradictions or disharmonies, dissonance, there are yep. all of these things that you choose a material and the physicality of the material, but then how does it come together? And what is the same thing I think about your the screen of the, the, the museum? There's something about that it's, that's kind of rhythmic that you that you respond to as in a kind of uh, unconscious way. That uh, do you think about that at all? You know, in terms of the choice of I mean, that's, uh, yeah, no, no, no. You hit a very. Um, I would say that my proportioning system is rhythm. That I that that my my organizational system and my proportioning system is is rhythmic completely. Um, to the point that I sometimes even experiment with my brother, who's a composer, on you know large sound works and buildings. But actually, you know, I'm a huge jazz fan, so I'm always like, I work in a studio. My in my studio, I've got jazz on all the time, <laughs> so it's sort of part of my flow. <laughs> and you know, you know, the Sugar Hill staggering. That's all just jazz mm -hmm. facade. It's actually standard. It's like Duke Ellington standard. You know, so it's it's there is a kind of system that I'm referring to in black culture, which is this idea of the rhythm as, you know, form maker. That's really fascinating to me. And and it's, it's, it's um, you know, even, you know, even the dem facades, which look like they're just static, are actually being playfully, they're playfully organizing the way in which the dissolve of the mass of the building is happening. And they, they're rhythm, rhythmically doing it. It's like finding junctions, moments, you know, connections, ends. It's, it's all musical. Yeah, I, I feel the same, in, and I'm always listening, you know, it's, it's anything, like mostly jazz, actually mostly reggae and jazz, but, yeah. um, you know, yes. I, I, there's very few music that I don't, that I, there isn't any, any music that I hate. I can find something in yeah. it, you know, and I think that, uh, that, that you know, like if, if somebody's into this, you know, I'm like, okay, I got to find why. What is it yeah. about? Either it's like screaming, you know, like you have heard that, and I'm like, mm. Wow, really? You listen to this, and, and and sometimes you know I'll have my assistants, whatever they're working, listening to later. I want to hear what you're, you know, what you work with. Just yeah. to see how people are, you know, it's this, it's about tapping into the unconscious, right? And I'd be like that rhythm, a sound is something that we we take for granted, you know, and it's such a a powerful underlying um, material that you know finding ways to engage with and finding ways to to figure it out. You know, I, I think is is so um, important. You know, yeah. I, I think, think it's very. No, I I was gonna say I just think it's you know it's kind of an abstract thing, but this idea, it's very humanistic for me. It sort of takes proportions and systems. For me, sounds really are about everything to do with how the body is kind of measuring and understanding, and so I think it's innately built into it. Um, and so you know, I just think that somehow even a child to a you know, a very sophisticated person can always perceive, if they, even if they can't articulate, that idea of, of form. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very human experience, yeah. We yeah. have so much 
We have the Sonos system in our office. Sorry, we just feel silly. <laughs> we, we, I, I, I peer into what my, 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 my teams are listening to, the sort of juniors and seniors, because we sort of have a free DJ thing where everybody uploads anything they want. So we're like, okay, who's is that <laughs> in the studio? We're like listening to different tracks of you know, people. Yeah, I, I think I'm a, I'm a frustrated DJ also. You know, I my my uh, wife was looking at me and shaking her head because she thinks that you know, I, I'm going through this midlife crisis because I bought this the best and the loudest uh, Bluetooth sound uh, speaker yeah. that you can get, yeah. you know, ex incredibly expensive. And she's like, why do you have that? You know what? I said, no, it's the loudest you can get. You know, and, <laughs> it's, you know it's just, just power. I it's I power. It. <laughs> it was like DJs use it all the time. She's like, you're not a DJ. <laughs> Doesn't you matter. <laughs> Absolutely. Beautiful. Well, um, even in the, sorry, Nora. Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't even want to like make my voice known because you guys are just, it's so amazing to listen to you. I know that we have some questions from the audience at some point, but I don't, I don't mean to, I'm doing exactly what I did want, which is shutting it down. The no, 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 no. last thing I wanted to say, because I, I wanted to talk about, you know, part of the framework of the shoelace pieces, I'm always thinking, because they're, no. you know, it's an introduction of, of lines, but it's also color. But I, I do think of them rhythmically and, and about almost like it's a, a sound composition. So anyway, the we the people getting back to that. I love the way, sorry, just to give you, you know, the curation of that show, that putting it on the facade like that and, you know, seeing also the other installations in the city and this idea of sort of migrating the sort of the exhibition into the city. I think it's so profoundly beautiful. So congratulations on that. I think it's- That's Nora's doing because I, you know, when she came to me and, and sort of pitched this, the idea, uh, I was like, that made sense because my regard for the shoelaces that they had to be part of the architecture. You know, the mm -hmm. idea that this humble material, you'd have to take the trouble of putting hundreds of holes in your wall and to make this thing what it is and, ha and give it the power. That, so that, that moment of labor had to be introduced to it. And then she says, oh, well, on the build, on David's build, the building, I was like, yeah, that sounds great, because I was always thinking about it in terms of architecture. So, And that thing is, what's, you know, I think you've really demonstrated how the, the building was somehow, I dared to see if anybody could tackle it. And I think you just, you just conquered it. So I love that. I, I remember when I saw the image and I posted it, I was like, oh my God, somebody's done it now. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> It lasted maybe a decade, and it's done. Uh, I must say, just a little anecdote. I loved when I was watching the the DNC sort of um, uh, sort of speeches, and when Barack was talking, and um, there was a thing, and, and basically it had we the people sort of yeah. <laughs> just about him. And I thought, yeah. I'm sure the Nari would. The team looked at Nari's work. I should sure. call him. I should call him. You know, did he get the misses from me? <laughs> like I'm sure. <laughs> he, they they know the art world too well. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, thank you both so much. This has just been a riveting conversation. Uh, I want to just pull up a couple of questions from our audience. Um, who are, People are joining us from all over the world, which is extraordinary and no surprise given the huge kind of following of admirers um, that, that you have. I, I'm going to pull up the first question, um, which is from Olympia, and it's to you, Neri. She asks, do exhibits change somewhat with the type of space available in the museum? And are you inspired differently each time, I'm presuming, each time that you have a different exhibition? Oh, yes, that's, that, uh, they, it has to, you know, and, and uh, the, the thing about every um, installation is different, one, because of the scale of this, the rooms, but also the lead from maybe um, one object into the next. And I'm always learning from that because they're, especially in the group show that you, it's like 25, over 25 years of your practice, the idea that something from in the 90s, um, what conversation they might have with something, you know, more contemporary. So the way those things evolve in terms of the installation of this building is always a learning experience for me as well. Yeah, the necessary uh, aspect of it too. Well, and each of you have spoken so much about how your work and your practice is so site responsive. Um, you know, whether it's responding to the community, the city, the neighborhood that you're in, or the particular, you know, dynamics of the space that it's in. I think that sensitivity that each of you bring 
to the projects that you're working on. It's part of what makes the experience as a viewer so special because you feel like it has it has molded itself to the, you know, as you said earlier, kind of the DNA almost of of that site um, and of that 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 space in the city um, or whatever the locale may be. Um, all right, another question. This one is for David. It's from Ethos and Aftermath. Uh, great, great handle. Uh, does the window placement in the facade of the Sugar Hill project have anything to do with controlling light and temperature, or is it mostly aesthetic? What does the interior interior of the space look like? I think we got to show one image of the interior um, earlier, but unfortunately, not not enough. It's a it's a it's a often misunderstood thing. A lot of people think I just sort of threw the windows up. If only I could. No, um, I made this huge sort of argument with our clients that I wanted windows that would have different effects. We could we don't we could only afford a certain amount of window space. Oh, this is actually not the windows that he's talking about. He's talking about the facade. But anyway, yeah. But, well, and the front one, not this one. But anyway. <laughs> 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 so the idea was that we would make different size windows that would frame the view in the different views towards the East River the north and the south, depending on your elevations. But also we wanted windows that were low, that allowed children to have, you know, there's this whole thing of like apartments having just one datum. Um, and when you're in these low income apartments, they just have these regimented, almost like cell block arrangements, which I really have always hated. And I wanted to get away from that sort of ridiculous sort of, you know, repetition of a kind of regimented set of, you know, for me, you know, isolation wards, you know, and I wanted the idea of this home to feel like it it was about different human experiences, and different ages. So the windows are about being low, framing low views, framing large skyline views, framing side views. And we only had a certain amount of glass. And rather than putting one window in, I scattered them into this kind of diversity of windows. So it made a new facade. And a lot of people asked questions. At the beginning, a lot of critics were like, he just threw those windows up. And I was like, do you think you can drop windows on a building of this level of complexity and cost and this kind of stakeholder i mean it's amazing sometimes what critics say is when you're like <laughs> but, but you know having gone in and seeing what that does those low windows you, you get more out of them you, they, they feel oh. larger you know yeah you don't, you're not accustomed to seeing windows that low and and actually um, you know uh you, uh, that's what i that was a surprise for me because i was one of the critics david and then <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't feel small. It really works. Uh, I literally, I remember I had to keep my mouth shut. It was sort of said a few times and I was like, all right, it'll, it'll all come out. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, all right. We have one last question. Uh, this is from Bridget Smith. Mr. Ward, can you talk about the construction of We the People and the endless number of shoelaces? Yeah. So, um, Talk about site specificity. That piece was done initially. Um, goodness, I want to lose track of when maybe, oh goodness, maybe 2003, 2002. Anyway, it was early on before before our so-called uh, president, um, way before that. And and so it was done in collaboration with the um, with the Fabric Workshop in Philadelphia. And because it's in Philadelphia, I really wanted to do something that was site specific. And I was at the time I was working with text uh, with the, the shoelace pieces. So I said, well, this is an important text. It's a text that a lot of people don't pay attention to as much anymore. They take for granted. And I thought by rearticulating them in this material of the body that relates to the body, that that was one thing. But also what's really important about the reading of this, if you go to this space, is that depending on where you stand in the room because of the scale of the letters, it becomes legible or illegible. There's some moments where you don't know what you're looking at, at the right also distance. And I liked that idea that the by moving around this work, by engaging with it in terms of space, it it um it changes. And so all of those factors, uh plus the site specific nature of it was really why and I was working at the Fabric Workshop was how this work um started. And of course it's evolved into you know a lot more which is exciting as well absolutely and uh i just want to take a moment to thank each of you for sharing so many um meaningful and and uh, i think impactful and inspired um 
observations, comments, experiences, anecdotes, um, and mostly just sharing your time with all of us. It has been such a pleasure and truly an honor to welcome both of you together. And uh, let's do this again next week, you guys. <laughs> I'm sure you're not busy, you've got nothing else going on. Um, and to our audience, thank you all so much for spending an hour plus with us. Uh, there's much more of this type of programming that we have in store in the fall. And we look forward to just continuing to catalyze these really amazing conversations and bring as many people um, as are interested and open to be a part of them. So once again, thank you all so much. I want to thank Sarah Bai and Hasti Sultani for bringing this to life. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your day or night, depending on where you are. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Nari. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.